Cream Ray, your host at the One Soccer Nation podcast. And today I have the pleasure of interviewing Chris McCarthy. Chris is the co-founder and COO at Van Saves. Chris, thanks for taking the time for joining us today. How's it going? Going great. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely. So can you just take us back in time and, you know, just share, you know, why you started Van Saves? Yeah, absolutely. Um... It's kind of a funny story. I played minor professional hockey for seven years, got the opportunity towards the end of my career to transition into the front office. And in my last year, I was actually playing and working in the front office as the sales and marketing director. Um, so before I, I was given that position in the front office, um, in my last year playing hockey, I actually got in a fight, typical Canadian hockey player, right? Uh, behind the net, protecting my goalie. And I actually ended up like breaking my finger. So I was going to miss... 11 weeks of the season, I had to get surgery. So I had gone to the owner and at the time we were kind of struggling for ticket sales and sponsorship and I had experience working in the front office. So from that point, I was named the sales and marketing director of the team. That's when I met my co-founder, Shannon. She owned her own marketing company. She was doing some work with the team. Um, and from that point, we just kind of like took over the team together as the front office. Um, and in the summertime, you know, we were out selling sponsorship and kept running into the same problem where brands in our community wanted more than just the traditional sponsorship inventory that we were selling, like rink boards, scoreboard ads, and jersey patches and wall signs. And what these businesses really wanted was something that was digital, something that could drive our fans into their business and allow them to collect customer analytics. We didn't have anything like that. So we left a lot of deals on the table and we had sponsors that were handing us boxes of coupons paper coupons and we just thought there had to be a better way to engage our fans with our corporate partners while satisfying their needs and there wasn't anything out there so we created fan saves as the solution that's amazing let's get rid of this paper let's get rid of it digitalization the world that we're living in today could you could you walk us through how fan saves uh digitally digitally activities fan fan sorry i'm gonna cut that out could you walk us through how Fansaves digitally activates fans through discounts and deals provided by team sponsors and how this differs from traditional sponsorship methods? Yeah, so uh, fans can follow their favorite teams uh, by downloading our app or going to our website to create their free account. So they can follow their favorite teams, think Instagram, but instead of seeing pictures, they get access to discounts and deals provided by the team sponsors, which they can engage with and redeem in store or online, depending on the type of business. And, you know, we found that working in the front office, like oftentimes our fans couldn't even recall who our sponsors were. So years later, once we founded Fansaves, we actually did a research study and surveyed fans, sports fans all across North America. And we found that 90% of sports fans can't name more than five of their favorite team sponsors. We call this the Fansaves Challenge. Um, so if the team's fans don't know who the sponsors are outside of the venue, they're much less likely to actually go and support those businesses. Sports fans are super loyal beings. They really want to support their team. And by extension, they want to support the sponsors that make it all possible for professional sports to happen. But if they don't know who those partners are, as I mentioned, they're a lot less likely to do so. So really what we're doing is just incentivizing fans to actually care who those sponsors are by offering them discounts and deals and allowing them to redeem those deals right on their phone instead of really traditional redemption methods like handing out paper coupons, you know, downloading a third party app or simply just mentioning the deal at the point of purchase, which doesn't track any fan data for the team or the sponsor, which in 2023 is really important for them to know. Absolutely. You took me through this challenge, which was a pretty <laughs> cool process for Toronto FC. And I was able to mention about three. So that was pretty cool. Three or four. I, I think I gave you four. <laughs> yeah. And what's the ranking system you go based off? If, if someone gets one, what's the ranking based off that? You know, generally people can think of like the name of the arena. They can think of like the beverage provider, call it Bush Light or Bud Light or whatever it is. But beyond that, like if you think about it, and I'm sure everyone that's listening to this podcast right now is thinking of their favorite team and like how many sponsors they can name. You know, when people go to a sporting event, they care about like who won, who lost, the emotion that you felt when your team scored or if there was a fight, like just the emotions. And when you leave the venue, you're not really thinking about like, who the sponsors were. And when you're in venue, you're just totally like um, 
overrun with like sponsors ads it's just everywhere right um so when you leave the venue it's very difficult for a lot of sports fans to actually retain those who those sponsors are and how else would you know who the sponsors of your favorite team are right sometimes they're listed on the website sometimes they're not but even if they are listed on the website like really like who cares like fan saves gives them a reason to care who the sponsors are because they're able to save money and let's be honest we're living in a time of like high inflation and and cost of living and if you can support your favorite team and save a buck at the same time it's a win-win for everybody absolutely i want to plug you in here for fan saves you mentioned how fans could get access to this platform there's also i've been on the website there's also a, a portal for companies or organizations to get set up with you guys can you take us through that process yeah, great question. So definitely teams can uh, reach out through our About website and they can book a customized demo and we can walk them through all the benefits of our platform for their teams and their partners. But there's also a spot where brands that are interested in becoming a partner of a team can reach out. And instead of going through like the traditional process of negotiating the sponsorship and all the traditional assets that are included in those traditional sponsorship packages. At the end of the day, what brands really want is people coming back into their business because of their partnership and actually being able to track that return on investment. Um, you know, all the other branding opportunities, depending on your goals for what your business is, are great, but they might not be at the end of the day exactly like what you want. A lot of businesses just want that activation and fan saves is a way where it can be sold as a core asset or it can be sold as like, you know, an entry level asset to the brands um, and they can offer a deal. Um, we also have triggered deals, which are really uh, popular on our platform. So everyone can think of like those events that happen during a game um, that could trigger a deal from a partner. So, you know, in soccer, if a team scores a goal in the first half, if the team wins, if the opposing team gets, you know, two yellow cards in a game, like these are all events that happen during a soccer game that can trigger a deal from a partner. So. Um, those are really popular on our platform and, and drive a lot of the redemptions through fan saves. Got it. With fan saves working with over 75 organizations and offering discounts from over 1,300 brands, how do you maintain the platform's relevance and adaptability to different sports teams and organizations? Yeah, like when we created this platform, my co founder and I, as I mentioned, we were working in minor pro hockey, but we thought, like, if we have this problem, maybe other teams have this problem too. So we looked elsewhere in the industry and we found that so many teams were still using paper coupons and these like really traditional redemption methods. So one of our growth strategies as a brand new startup was to try to acquire at least one new team in as many different leagues as we could so that we could build a case study and earn a testimonial to bring to all these other teams within those leagues. So you know, six short years later with a two year pandemic sandwiched in the middle, um, we're working with teams in over 24 North American sports leagues um, from NASCAR to, you know, the National Lacrosse League and Major League Rugby, right down to, you know, single A pro hockey and U United Soccer League. So um, it really validated and justified that all these teams have the same problem of justifying return on investment to their partner partners and actually activating their fans to engage with their partners. But you know, as we think bigger picture and longer term with our, our company and what we're really doing, like everyone can be a fan of anything, right? Everyone's a fan of something, whether it's a university and college, your son or daughter's youth sports team. Think like athletes, events, festivals, esports teams, all of these organizations all have the same problems of being able to justify ROI to their partners. And on the brand side, you know, like the QSR restaurant category is definitely popular on our platform. You throw it in a major franchise in the restauranting business, and I can almost guarantee you they're offering a deal, at least in one city on our platform. But uh, from there, we really branched out. You think like every team has a host hotel. Every team generally has a fitness partner, an automotive partner, retail partners. Like these are all really great opportunities for these brands to engage fans and actually drive them in through their their door to uh, to redeem deals how long does it usually take you guys to close a partnership deal you mentioned united soccer league nascar how long have these deals taken you guys to close yeah i mean uh some deals take longer than others uh we've really played the long game and we've really tried to work our way up the ranks from the minor professional levels right from the major junior single a pro level all the way up to the major leagues with nascar and the national lacrosse league so um, definitely some take longer than others. Um, just 
right like before this call i just came from the usl winter summit and had the opportunity to present to a number of different teams on the ticketing side about the application our platform has to help them sell more tickets and engage with their corporate partners and about two weeks ago i also presented at another usl league wide call more on the sponsorship side so you know these league partnerships are really a b2b play for us as like a, a sports tech startup to get in front of the decision makers and you know bypass having to cold call and cold email and you know clog up the inboxes of all these teams that you know get bombarded with companies trying to sell them on things all day long so that league partnership strategy has been really effective for us but also our clients sharing with other teams in the industry about their success and their experience with our platform has been a really big driver so um, you know, those deals like NASCAR, they take a, a longer time to, to materialize, right? You can't just, I use the, um, you know, I use the, the professional sports athlete, whether you're a hockey player or a soccer player, like you grow up, you play youth sports, then you, you know, work your way up to the professional level. And then you work your way up from there to the major league level. And it's the same thing with like a startup, right? You can't just go right from youth sports to the mls like you have to work your way up the ranks and kind of prove yourself along the way so that's really what we've done and that's really helped propel our brand and our company to where it is today 100 percent. i see you wearing the comcast shirt there um how was your experience going through the, the comcast nbc accelerator yeah so this is something that we're really really proud of you know um getting backed by a fortune 30 company one of the biggest brands in all of north america um not only gave us a lot of credibility as a company but a lot of confidence as founders that you know a major major brand of this scale sees the potential and the vision that we had for our company so um you know we applied to the comcast sports tech accelerator um, last year, we got accepted and, you know, in January, the announcement went out that we were one of 10 companies selected from out of 920 applications from around the world and the only Canadian companies selected. So we were really proud of that. Um, but the program has just been such an incredible resource for us, an incredible platform and opportunity. Um, there's really great partners of the accelerator, such as NASCAR, the PGA Tour, the WWE, and most recently, the Premier League. So we got first hand access to the decision makers of all of these major entities, um, which has really allowed us to do really good customer discovery and kind of like identify, identify, identify the pain points um, that these major brands and leagues have. So, you know, being able to kind of like conceptualize that even more, take it back to our teams, think about it, and then go back to these major brands, uh, which is kind of like what we're, we've done with the PGA Tour. And, um, you know, also got the opportunity to pilot with the NASCAR Chicago Street Race last July, um, which was amazing. Like there was, other than like the once in a generational rainstorm that Chicago had that that weekend, um, it was our second NASCAR race and it was just an incredible experience. We brought our whole team down. Um, but you know, the pilot went really well. We were able to build a really great case study and now we've signed a commercial deal with NASCAR. So, um, you know, it might've taken us years to get to that point, to get, you know, in touch with the chief development officer and to build that relationship. And now he's like a mentor to us and, you know, like he's, he's really been a, a big impact on our business and being able to say that, you know, we're, we're partnered with arguably one of the most recognizable sports brands in, in all of North America, if not the world, um, like I mentioned earlier, it has given our brand a lot of credibility. That's so cool. The, the positioning that you guys are in sounds very strong and a lot of momentum is happening. I'm thinking about competitors. Do you guys have any? We don't have direct competitors. There's definitely a lot of couponing platforms out there. There's a lot of fan engagement platforms out there, but we're kind of like sandwiched right in the middle. So we're in a unique position where we're like the first mover in this space. We're almost defining the space of sports couponing. So um, for us, you know, getting land grab, like getting as many teams and as many different leagues as I, as we can, like I mentioned, um, you know, really validate all those different sports, but also like, those league partnerships, right, are, are kind of helping us build our moat, our defensibility in case a competitor comes into the market and tries to duplicate what we're doing or has a feature that can compete with what we're doing. So um, we definitely have our ways of, you know, defending our company against any, 
you know, competitors that do come into the market. But as of now, we stand alone and we're defining this space. So um, it's a really, really great opportunity for us. And we're trying to move as fast as we can uh, without, you know, sacrificing the quality of our platform. First market movers. I like that. Um, I just had a thought that came to mind. You, oh man, it's going to disappear right when I'm going to ask it. Shoot. <laughs> I hate it when that happens. I use my excuse as I've had concussions playing hockey, so and you're gonna have to think of like a good excuse to <laughs> to get over those oh. those mind parts. <laughs> yeah, I got it. I got it. It came back. Right, right when I was gonna yeah, say. Yeah. So, okay, so you mentioned <laughs> you know companies, clubs, teams being cluttered with emails. You know, I've recently just got that experience now because of our company, and it's so annoying to deal with. Um, you mentioning partnering being one of those strategies that really helped. Introductions are the best. I love intros. So based off the success that you're producing for clubs, you're getting, uh, you're having that network effect happening where club owners or people that are dealing with the sponsorships introducing you to other uh, clubs, which is amazing. Um, so that's the best. So that sounds like the best way to go about it, eh? Um, I have to put the Canada A in there. <laughs> Pivoting. I love it. I wanted to just add that comment. <laughs> I love intros. Appreciate that. Um, the, the fan saves challenge highlights the issue of sports fans struggling to name favorite team sponsors you touched on this but i just want, really want to hone on this how does fan saves aim to address the challenge and increase sponsor visibility yeah i mean like um it varies but generally speaking like 30 percent of a team's budget is made up by sponsorship revenue so you know from working in the industry firsthand selling sponsorship i found it very difficult at the end of the year when i went to renew that sponsor to actually prove and justify them that their partnership was successful and we actually drove our fans into their business to purchase their product or service. Um, you know, it's very easy to pull from eyeballs and venue how many people were in the stadium and saw your ad on the field or on the pitch or on the scoreboard. On the scoreboard. Um, you know, you can pull metrics from social media, how many impressions, you know, how many likes and engagements, but that doesn't translate necessarily into um, conversion, right? And when a fan redeems a deal through our platform, they are at the point of purchase, whether they're in store redeeming the deal at, at the cashier or the server, or whether they're redeeming a deal online using a discount code uh, upon checkout. We are actually proving that a fan went through our platform and redeemed a deal right at the point of purchase. So that's justifying true conversion, true ROI for these brands. And going back to what I just mentioned, that's something that these teams that are selling sponsorship and tickets can add into their renewal reports at the end of the year to actually prove that their sponsorship was effective. Having said that, not every fan of a team is the type of fan that's going to redeem a deal, right? Some people might not be tech savvy. Some people might be in a position where they're wealthy and they don't care about, you know, 15% off or buy one, get one free. Although a lot of people that get wealthy are very scrappy and, and very nimble. So, I mean, we're really going after a type of fan that, you know, is generally a millennial, um, skews towards women. Women generally hold the purse strings in the family. So um, those are the types of fans that we, we typically promote to. But we work hand in hand with our team partners to promote the platform, which once they license it, is their platform to promote. If no fans know about the platform and the offers that are being, uh, the deals that are being offered by their partners, there's not going to be a lot of fans that redeem it. So it's really important for the teams and for us to work in hand in hand with them to effectively promote uh, the deals in the platform to their fan base. Cause you know, they already have those channels, social media, email marketing, um, in venue promotion onward and so forth. So um, that's our, actually our marketing model, our competitive advantage, going back to competitors, like we talked about earlier, we don't have to pay a team $10,000 to promote our brand. They're promoting their brand because they want fans to go to their fan saves page and actually redeem those deals from their partners. So that's our competitive advantage. Um, and that's how, how it works. Could you just share a little bit about funneling fans to um, that coupon? So what, what do clubs have to do in order to funnel them to that coupon? Yeah, and uh, it kind of piggybacks off of what I just mentioned. Like these teams have all of these avenues, all of these channels to reach their fans. So every team that we partner with, we have like a pick seven strategy. Um, you know, research shows that it takes upon seven touch points for a buyer to buy. And that's the same thing with, you know, actually redeeming a deal, right? So we have a pick seven strategy. Our team partners pick seven different channels that they're going to promote 
their fan saves page to their fans throughout the season and not just the length of the season, but also the off season as well too. Um, it's a year wide platform where these partners of teams can offer a deal to the fans, not just the length of the season, but also in the off season. Um, so by working with these teams, they're able to effectively promote the platform and the deals to their fans through their own channels. But in addition to that, we also do our own social media campaigns. We're partnered with a great company called Vozzy that can send out SMS campaigns if teams have a bank of phone numbers. Um, and then we also do some some other user acquisition, um, you know, podcasts and sponsor, um, you know, team podcasts and things like that that are affiliated with the team. So, um, yeah, we're we're raising our seed round right now. We just secured a lead investor. We're raising one million USD. A lot of that capital is going to be put into both user acquisition, uh, but also customer acquisition and, you know, getting more league partnerships and again, further building that mode for our company. Got it. You guys uh, were generating revenue. You guys were generating revenue before you started raising capital, right? Yes, we were. Yeah. yeah I always hear um, it's, it, it's easier. Oh, sorry. What were you going to say? No, no. Uh, I was just going to say like, started the company in 2017 couple years kind of just building the product validating with a few teams had a couple paying customers but very limited revenue and then the pandemic hit and that should have killed us it could have killed us and it killed a lot of other businesses my co-founder and i are extremely scrappy we did everything in our power to retain our employees and um continue to build the platform even during a period where everything was kind of shut down our three stakeholders our team sponsors and fans and as we all know during the pandemic there wasn't much of any of that so um Coming into 2022 was our first real sales year, and um, we've had a huge um, pr growth percentage since last year. Coming into this year is our second sales year. So now we're at the point where we're pitching investors, which is what you were leading on with your next question, where um, you know we're we're generating revenue. We've got um, product market fit, um, a scalable platform with scalable processes, and uh, you know a young, motivated but award-winning team that's there to back up our team partners every step of the way. So. We feel like we've really done everything that we could as a startup to put ourselves in a position to land an investor that is like-minded, sees our vision, but it can also provide value, right? And open up doors and, you know, make introductions. We don't want to just accept capital from anybody and someone that's just going to write a check. We want, you know, value out as well too. And we want them to believe in the vision that we have as well too. So, Absolutely. You mentioned COVID-19. COVID-19 killed a lot of things. It was crazy, hard times, very nice. Uh, to hear that you guys survived and congratulations to you guys and to all your success um and I, you know raising capital is i've heard easier to do when when you're re generating revenue and to show that to the investor how long did it take you guys to uh raise capital um or actually not raise to secure the capital how long did it take you guys yeah um it took us a while, like definitely towards the end of the pandemic, um, you know, we were able to raise a pre-seed round, but I mean, we pitched a lot of investors. Granted, we were very early looking back at that time and, um, you know, we were very low revenue and everything like that, but um, we ended up finding like a local family office that was looking to invest in a women-founded company. My co-founder is also our CEO, so we're a women-led company. Um, so I think we were part lucky, but also we put ourselves in the position for them to like, you know, identify and come across us. Um, we're the type of people that never say no, we show up. That's something that we really provide ourselves, pride ourselves on. And I think that's what really led to that opportunity. Um, and then they've also come in and led our, our seed round. So, um, you know, there's a lot of investors out there. Um, you really have to do your due diligence and, you know, not every investor is the right fit for you. So. They say you have to get a hundred no's to get one yes, and we can justify that. And, you know, especially being a women-led company, only like 2% of all venture capital goes to women-led businesses. So, you know, we're, we've found it even harder to raise capital. And, and not to say that like all these investors that we've met with turned us down because we're a, a woman-led company, but, um, you know, it's, it's no secret. There's hard evidence and facts out there that prove that that, that point to that. Um, so, you know, that's just another thing that we've had to overcome. And, you know, as startup founders, there's a lot of adversity, you know, like you embrace it as a startup founder and you embrace the suck. Um, and that's part of it, but, um, no, like just 
while you're raising, just keep your head down and grind and do the things that you need to do to be an attractive, investable company, a scalable company. And, you know, my co-founder and I, we really firmly believe that everything happens for a reason and what's meant to be will be. And if we do the right things, um, you know, and continue to, uh, to knock on doors and put ourselves in a position to be investable, like the right opportunity will come and it has. And now that we've secured a lead investor, um, we're having a lot of conversations and, and circling back to a lot of those other investors that kind of said, oh, like once you find a lead, like, you know, this is interesting to us, come back to us. So that's kind of like where we're at right now. Nice. Can you share a specific success story or case studies of organizations that have experienced significant increases, in ticket sales, sponsorship revenue, and fan engagement through the implementation of fan saves? For sure. I'll, I'll give two and I'll... I'll ask you to remind me in case I forget um, the, the NASCAR Chicago shoe race, but I'll start with the Fort Wayne Comets. Big shout out to Scott Sproat, owner of the Fort Wayne Comets. Been an incredible champion for us. Um, they were our second team in the East Coast Hockey League, the ECHL. Um, they have 33 different partners offering deals. So a really great variety and really good validation that, you know, a team can onboard that many partners. Um, so great variety for their fans. Not only did they have one of the most redemptions last year out of all of our teams, but they also really pushed like merchandise deals and offers heavily last year. So through our platform, we were able to help facilitate over $25,000 worth of merchandise purchases through their team store through our platform. So, you know, they easily six, seven X um, their return on investment with our platform just by selling merchandise. And really that wasn't even a feature or, you know, like, an avenue that we thought teams would really, we, we never even thought of that. When we created this, it was to sell sponsorship and then maybe to sell, help sell some tickets, but they took it to the next level and they really crushed it on the merchandise side. So now that's something that we pitch as part of our value for our platform when we talk to teams is not only can you help sell tickets, not only can this platform help you sell more sponsorship, but it's also a really great way to relay those deals being offered by the team on the merchandise side. So that's a great example. Um, and the ECHL has been an incredible partner of ours as well as the American Hockey League in the USL. But on the, coming out of Comcast uh, Accelerator, um, we were able to partner with NASCAR, like I mentioned earlier, for their NASCAR Chicago Street Race. Um, this was their inaugural race in Chicago. Um, they've never done like a street race of this kind. So it was brand new. And the reason they partnered with us specifically was because there were so many people coming from out of state to come to the race. And there were so many businesses that were affected by all the street closures because they built this track, this road course, downtown Chicago. So like incredible. If you haven't seen it, Google it, YouTube it. It was one of the most watched uh, NASCAR races ever on television. So it just showed like the interest and the popularity. But again, those businesses were really affected by the street closure. So with our pilot last year, we were able to onboard a lot of those businesses um, that were affected and then give them the opportunity to be connected with the fans that were coming from all over North America and beyond. We had one account that was created in Tokyo, Japan. So kind of just showed the reach, but uh, we were able to create some a really great case study, a lot of great redemptions. Uh, I think there was over 30 businesses that were offering deals in this pilot that we did. Um, and then, you know, post race, um, you know, we continued to talk to the NASCAR team and, and propose a commercial agreement. And now we've officially partnered with NASCAR uh, with their Chicago street race to help present their resource guide and power their resource guide is the right word um, to really connect those fans with their, their, um, their local businesses and their sponsors of the race. So those are two really great examples I wanted to share. Nice. Do you guys have your own, did you guys build out your own CRM or are you guys using another platform? Uh, no, I mean, we use HubSpot as our CRM, uh, mostly to just track the sales process. But, um, you know, for our team internally, we use Trello quite a bit um, to track all of our processes and, you know, GitHub on the on the development side as well as Trello. So, um, you know, we, we have our platforms that we've identified that work really well for us and that, um, you know, really make team communication really easy and effective. We also use Slack, um, you know, to, we're a fully remote company. We have um, nine, nine employees, 10 employees. We just, we're just about to make a hire, including Shannon and myself right across Canada um, from coast to coast. So, you know, these 
tech platforms, the CRM, these like um, management softwares are really, really important for us to be able to manage all of our processes and make sure that everyone's on the same page. Got it. Just switching gears here, and the last question that I'll have is um, the Living the Startup Podcast sponsored by Staples Canada. How has recorded over 85 episodes. How has the podcast contributed to promoting entrepreneurship and innovation? And what role has Staples Canada played in supporting this initiative? Yeah, so let's go back to the pandemic, um, you know, 2021 or 2020, whatever it was. Um, our whole business shut down. Like I mentioned, teams, can seasons were canceled. No one was shopping. So it was a really difficult time for us. And there was two things that we did that kept our brand alive. I'll get to the podcast in just a second, but I also wanted to share this because you asked about it earlier. And um, one of the things that we did was we started a gift certificate program. So we partnered with, I think it was like 62 communities across Canada, mostly chambers of commerce and tourism organizations. And we onboarded like their member businesses onto this platform that we created like through Shopify. And so they promoted it in the community. We were in like 62 different news releases all across Canada about this program. Um, and we were able to raise, we were able to help facilitate um, over $30,000 worth of gift certificate purchases, which all of went back to the small businesses that were affected by the closures to the pandemic. So that was something that we were really proud of. Um, it was a great, like, way for us to keep our brand relevant by also doing good during a really difficult time. But also at the same time, um, we wanted to like really, you know, continue growing our brand and make an impact. So we said, you know, we've wanted to start a podcast for a while. This is like the perfect opportunity to do it. And I believe with every challenge, it also presents an opportunity. And so for this, it was our podcast, Living the Startup. Uh, we called it that because we we say it all the time, like that we're living the startup. We are truly living the startup grind. Um, so our podcast interviews other entrepreneurs um, that, you know, are, are living their own startup or, you know, growing their own business. We talk about the wins, the losses, the lessons learned and life behind the brand. And, um, you know, about 15, 20 episodes in, I can't remember, um, we approached Staples, uh, Staples Canada and um, asked them to become a partner of the podcast. And they did. Uh, we offer a discount code through our podcast. Um, and we were also featured in their small business profile um, back in 2021 on their website. So, you know, attaching our podcast to a really credible, recognizable brand uh, really helped, you know, help us get more um, great guests on our show and give legitimacy to the podcast. And it's something that we've continued and we're really excited to share your episode soon coming up. But um, like you mentioned, over 80 episodes in, and it's it's been something that's been really fulfilling for us because not only do, you know, like we guest on, we guest on a lot of podcasts like I'm doing here today, and but our podcast gives us the opportunity to share those stories and those lessons learned and, you know, from other founders and share their, their uh, experiences. Um, but also we've learned a lot from talking to other founders. Like it's really great to hear similar challenges and you know things that other founders are going through and lessons learned and, and great advice so it's been a really great fulfilling thing for us to do and we're so proud that we started it and uh it all came from a really difficult time so yeah chris i'm definitely gonna need your help for sponsorship we've been uh, down the path a bit longer but yeah i uh, definitely gonna need your expertise um those are all the questions that i have um was there anything that you wanted to add in just wanted to give a shout out to St. Louis uh, SC, uh, St. Louis City SC. So, um, you know, growing up in Canada, hardcore hockey fan, uh, played minor pro, you name it. Um, but, you know, soccer is like a really quickly growing sport in Canada. Um, the women's national team really put Canada on the map, but lately also the men's team has been making big strides in, on the international stage. So for me, I had never been to like, a professional soccer match in my life. Uh, we do have the Canadian Premier League up here in Canada, and there is a team about an hour away from us in Ottawa, the Athletico. But um, when we were in St. Louis for the last leg of the Comcast NBC program, we got the opportunity to go to a St. Louis City FC game. And it was such an experience for me. It's something that uh, I'll definitely remember for a long time and look forward to going to a lot more games. I couldn't believe it. Like the team would get across half field and everyone would stand up and it was just like such a, an awesome atmosphere. And I really didn't understand it at the time coming from like hockey, right? It was so much action, there's hits, there's fights. 
and you know like the game I, I think it ended up in a 0-0 zero, zero draw and I was just like what like I didn't understand it but at the same time I had such a blast it was such an incredible experience and I have so much love for the beautiful game um so it's been uh, a pleasure to to be here on the podcast with you and to share my story and um just to share my love for soccer and football around the world it's amazing uh well Chris I appreciate you taking the time for joining us on the One Soccer Nation podcast it's been a pleasure I appreciate you having me on the show thanks so much Kareem Thank you.